Uh, I'd just first like to begin by thanking uh, Brian, Louis, uh, Alyssa, Brent, and everyone else who's shown us a really good time here. Uh, we've had an amazing time in Texas so far, and we're really happy to be here. Um, although I feel a little bit cheated, because Brian spent the whole day at the Texas Fair telling me, you know what, you have to have photos taken. Your parents will never forgive me. Your, your grandparents will cry if they don't see photos of you straddling a horse, or, you know, like, soaking wet. <laughs> now I know the real reason. <laughs> The second thing I would say is I want to give you some reasons to be sympathetic to the British in general. <laughs> the first thing to say is that, that as you may have guessed, we're, we're, we're unfortunately chronic alcoholics in the UK. <laughs> uh, and so obviously coming to America, US beer has a slightly different taste. Um, but if there's one recommendation that we might give you, it, it doesn't get better when you fry it. So. <laughs> As much as I'd love to tell jokes for the evening, there's a very serious issue here today. And I think the government team thought that we were the, the symbols of free speech and republicanism. You know, we didn't care about equality. Actually, we do. We think this particular policy does nothing to solve and, in fact, increases the inequality in election campaigns. And that's what we're going to try and show you today. Um, firstly, uh, though, there are a few things I need to deal with with the case that Brett set out. He said, we care about equality. There are all these people who have loads of money who are donating. I mean, if that's your problem, and Brett seems to only really care about people with loads of inherited wealth, then tax that inheritance, right? But they have to give us a good reason as to why, in every other facet in society, whether it be healthcare, or education, or anything else you do, you are given more options if you're wealthy. You are given some kind of reward. And we need some kind of response to that sort of argument. But if he really cares about equality, and remember, his analysis was, they give the same amount, so it's equal. Then, as this one decides, if you are an incumbent candidate, right, you have exactly the same amount of money to spend under their policy as the other guy, as the person trying to chip you out of office. But you have a huge incumbent advantage, and your incumbent advantage at the moment is times by 10 when you limit that particular spending. Incumbents can use Air Force One to fly around the country. They can use presidential addresses. They can use a whole range of things through state funding, subtly, to be able to disadvantage other candidates. And this system means that regardless of how good that other candidate is, how good that opposition person is, they can never trump that particular advantage. So a permanent incumbent advantage is one of the big unequal things which are given. Secondly, we say that actually, lobbying will still happen, but this time it will be unaccountable. At the moment, there are disclosure requirements. If you raise campaign advertising, if you donate, you can see a list of people who are donating, right? You can see those sorts of things. Under this particular system, well, there are, there are limits, right? I mean, it's why, for instance, we have statistics about, you know, you know, particular groups donating to particular campaigns or running spot ads. We say under this particular system, actually, you have a problem. Because you can still get those donations. You can get companies running ads through soft advertising, running sympathetic ads to those campaigns that still promote that message, that still get there. But there's, there's an underlying inability to have that direct link and see exactly who has donated, exactly who supports that campaign, and exactly who supports that particular thing. So actually, you still get companies influencing. You still get campaign organizations involved. But you can't track that particular involvement. And even if you don't have a requirement to track them, you probably should have at the moment. Right, so there are three things I'm going to talk about. I'm going to show you why it will undermine attempts to reach voters. I'm going to show you, secondly, why actually it gives enormous power to the media, who Brett admitted were biased and therefore probably not a good group of people to give more power to. And finally, I'm going to show you why actually it hardens the campaign message and why it's going to turn into a much more negative campaigning atmosphere as a result of this policy. So here's the first one. Regardless of the imbalance in funding, right, money means you reach more voters. <coughs> Look at what Obama did. Over 80% of his campaign contributions were from individual voters, right? He's raised more money than any election so far. But without that money, without the kinds of figures we've seen, you can't produce as many flyers, you can't coordinate volunteers, you can't target campaigns to people who otherwise wouldn't be interested in elections, and you can't run registration drives for voters who otherwise wouldn't vote. So who does that harm? Well, it means that eventually candidates only care about swing states. They don't care about 18 to 25 year olds. They don't care about disenfranchised African Americans in particular boroughs because they're not the people that go out to vote. So when you've got that limited pot of cash, 
Actually, what you get is a situation where candidates only care about the core swing voters because they've got that core of money available and they can't spend any more. And elections are huge, you know, offer huge space to these uh, uh, candidates. And they're not going to gamble on trying to engage disengaged voters who really should be engaged in the whole process. So fewer people will be engaged. And more importantly, the people who need to be engaged more than anyone else, the people whose very lives often depend on the quality of their life, depend so much on what government does, are the people who won't turn out under this system. Secondly, the cap empowers uh, already an incredibly unfit and biased media that the US has, right? I mean, Fox News, and MSNBC, whichever way you want to spin it, there are huge input biases to both news stations. Where you have fewer funds for direct advertising, where you can't target people on Facebook, well, you can't run as many TV commercials. How do you get your message across? Well, it's through media. It's through doing interviews. It's through trying to get free advertising. And when you need the support of those particular media outlets, if you're a Republican, you need the support of Fox News, instead of playing to a wide variety of different interest groups, no matter how much you hate them, your main constituency is the constituency of one, and it's the Fox News director or the MSNBC News director who you need to get support from in order to get your message across. And that's an incredibly powerful tool to give unelected, unrepresentative groups a huge amount of power to dictate the kinds of people that will be successful in elections. Here's the final one. It's going to dramatically make your campaigns even more attack-based and negative than they are at the moment. Apart from the UK, we really don't have negative advertising. Like, I mean, our humans are pretty aggressive, but we just don't have attack ads. But what happens is that if you want free advertising, what do you do? You say something controversial. You say that someone is a, is a non-Christian extremist, just like that Perry preacher did this week. You say you launch a swift boat ad campaign, and it gets played for free on the newsrooms. The trouble with that is, it can, this whole cap incentivizes people to get free advertising, right? Because they've got no other way of getting it at the moment. And that means, of course, the nastiest stuff gets the news media interested and gets them to run it for 24 hours. So what you get with this system is a system which is not equal. A system which really harms the participation of the most vulnerable groups in our society. And one which fundamentally will make attack, attack adverts more present. And that turns off voters more than anything else. So for those reasons, we beg to oppose. Yeah, can we have more sources? 
Well, you should, you're surely, but, but then again, if you're about equality, and you're saying that only people that watch cable TV can, can judge things fairly on, as a result of your policy, you're happy with that? Uh, how did you get there? <laughs> that was a logic jump that I didn't get. Uh, but uh, even those who don't have cable TV would have ABC, NBC, the national broadcast channels, which uh, even then are probably even less partisan than the two uh, prime cable news networks that you mentioned. So, uh, how would you say for the ABC, uh, NBC, NPR? Okay. okay, so at best, there's a wash, right? At best, now you have channels and other means of getting to candidates. Under this system, lots of those channels, particularly quite popular ones, suddenly become one of the only means of communicating okay. with. Uh, I, I want to segue really quick here. We have 15 seconds. Uh, you say that people will make spectacles of themselves to get on the news. Do you think that that's an effective way of getting elected? Uh, I mean, come on, how else did Sarah Palin get a nomination? <laughs> <laughs> she, uh, she got the nomination, but she didn't get elected. Thank you, American people. <laughs>